Debbie Clausen. So Debbie, um, who is a tier three consultant with SETBC, and um, I met Debbie virtually for the first time yesterday, but I have a feeling that you're in for a treat of a, a new uh, program that they're putting together. I think it's kind of a pilot um, working with 3D Tactuals. I have done uh, a little bit of promoting of 3D Tactuals in the world of uh, complex communication needs as well. So mm -hmm. I'm really also interested in hearing your talk. So so, um, it was a happy thing for me in that regard that I get to be here today. Um, so Debbie and I chatted, some of you have heard. If you do have questions, and if you could post it in the chat, um, I will be monitoring the chat so that Debbie doesn't have to worry about that so much when she's doing her talk. So with that, I'm going to turn off my camera and I'm going to mute myself and uh, take it away, Debbie. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Debbie. I am a tier three consultant here at ZBC, which um, may not mean a whole lot to, to most of you, but what I do is I have students around the province who are assigned to my caseload who need assistive technology in order to uh, participate in their classroom and in the curriculum. Um, and so I help their teams figure out what technology they need and how to use it and, and how to use it towards inclusion, um, particularly. Uh, in the last couple of years, my focus has turned to vision. Um, I am in the vision program at UBC this year, uh, finishing in August, so that's exciting. Um, and so, but I've been focused on vision for a little while here at ZBC already. Um, and I, I've been working together with Flo Wong, who is a ZBC um, vision teacher. She was going to be presenting today, but unfortunately she's injured her back. So here I am. Um, but we did work together on this project. Uh, so this was a pilot project that we started last year. Actually, let me just start sharing my screen with you. All right, there we go. Yeah, so our project was about 3D printing uh, to support learning for students with visual impairments, and we were particularly looking at literacy. So this is me, I'm Debbie, you can email me if you have any questions later or any thoughts at dclawson at sebc.org. Um, and this is Flo, who sadly is recovering from a back injury. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at what our project was. I'll tell you a little bit about how it worked and things like that. Um, and then interspersed throughout, I'll, I'll share some student stories and we've got some great videos. If any of you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to throw them into that chat box. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you kind of want to go in a bit of a different direction, feel free. Um, we can go wherever this takes us. But we'll start off with, with what the project looked like. So we started off with a few um, inquiry questions and we were specifically looking at how 3D printed objects could support literacy and concept development in students with visual impairments or deaf blindness. We wanted to look at is uh, whether or not there was value in the TVIs having the opportunity to 3D print on location and on demand. We also wondered whether 3D printing was better suited to science and math rather than literacy. So we specifically looked at literacy. Um, some of our teams did a little bit outside of the literacy scope, but for the most part, we were looking at literacy. So we had five teams around the province and every team had a student or a teacher of students with visual impairments. And then some teams also included um, an educational assistant, a braillist, uh, possibly a design and drafting teacher, a resource teacher. Um, and we started off by all coming together so that we could learn how to use the equipment together. So uh, that picture that you see there is we were looking at calibrating the 3D printers. Um, each team was provided with either a MacBook or um, a Surface Pro, as well as the Ditto Pro 3D printer, a few um, tools, and then some, um, some of the filament uh, in different colors. 
And project accountability happened through our professional learning community. So we had monthly online meetings. Um, after that first meeting where we were all together, we met monthly after that online. Um, and so each team had a blog online where they would talk about their experiences um, and share some of the things that they were up to. Um, as well, a lot of the teams had a partner, an education partner in the school where they were located um, so that they had some backup, um, they could collaborate together and they, they could build a strong connection uh, with the school community. And every team had slightly different goals. So there was a team who was looking at braille signage in uh, the secondary school. Um, a team wanted to look at miniature buildings um, we had another team, well, a couple of our teams were supporting literacy concept development for students with complex needs. So in that picture there, you see we've got the three bears uh, and three beds and chairs and bowls. So we, we wanted to um, specifically look at what would be criteria for our success. And we were looking at um, educator standpoint, uh, success, what success would look like for the student. We wanted to look at planning and decision making, um, the time that it took, cost, accountability, and then just general logistics of 3D printing. In terms of educator uh, considerations, Flo came across this concept of casual makers um, and, and thought that it really fit with us as um, teachers of students with visual impairments starting this 3D printing project. We didn't have prior experience with fabrication. We were not necessarily technology enthusiasts, but we came into this with a lot of enthusiasm and optimism. Um, and but but we faced a really steep learning curve because our background wasn't in things like 3D printing, um, and we had we had limited experiences. Um, and as we went through the process of of this year long project, we realized that the TSBI may not be the person who should be producing these 3D printed objects. Um, and you'll see why as as I kind of go on. Um, uh, and, and share about some of our stories. But it's possible that an alternate format producer, such as a Brailleist um, or someone else, might be the best person to support on-site 3D printing. Uh, and then looking at the student, what we printed and why we printed it would have to do with things like um, the student's past visual history, whether their uh, visual impairment was congenital versus adventitious, that definitely changed how the student would interact with the objects. Um, and we looked at things like learning media preferences, haptic preferences, um, their experience and their knowledge about tactile graphic use. And then um, we really thought about um, understanding scale in terms of size, the scale of objects from a visual impairment perspective. Um, so things like how Clifford the Big Red Dog is a dog, but when you actually compare him to um, Emily Elizabeth, she's quite a lot smaller. And so we would want to print something that was, um, that had an accurate scale for the students to understand. Um, we we looked a lot into how we would decide what to print. Um, and Josh Meal is uh, a person who does a lot of 3D printing exploration for students with visual impairments in California. Um, and his motto is that you print something that is too big, too small, too fragile, or too dangerous to use the real object. Um, and we would also add, we would print things that are too uh, imaginary, that, that don't actually exist, and then too distant, remote, or inaccessible. Now you see a little figure of Groot there. Um, we would also print things that um, are too expensive to purchase online or are not possible to purchase online, Groot. Um, uh, however, is is readily available to purchase. You want to compare the costs and the time of the printing to how much it would cost to purchase or to print out um, a model yourself. 
Uh, so we also looked at the decision making tree um, from the diagram center in order to think about what we were going to print and if it was worth printing or not. Um, in, and we, um, in order to acquire the 3D modeling files, you can create a model, a 3D model yourself, um, or you can download a 3D model. Now, most TSBIs don't know how to create 3D digital 3D models from scratch. I myself would love to be able to create things from scratch, but am not there yet in my learning myself. Um, but you can also download 3D models. Um, so most of our, our TBIs downloaded 3D models that already existed in repositories. Um, there was a tiny bit of customization that was done, but again, that's another steep learning curve to customize those digital files. Um, so this is an example of um, a, a file that, uh, that we downloaded and then we um, did we did customize it. So this is a Braille nameplate, and we were able to customize it so that um, so that it said something different. But that's that's a pretty steep learning curve to dive into that coding. Um, this is an example of. Um, of one of the 3D models that we found online and downloaded. So it was the Eiffel Tower. Now this is one that we actually scaled down a little bit um, because 3D printing is a really time consuming process. And as I'll mention later, it's something that you actually need to be present for. Um, and so we, um, we had to import the, the model into our, um, into the software that comes that can be used with the 3D printers that we had. So in this case, it was Tinkering Suite, uh, and this is where we could scale it down a little bit. And this is an example of our first print here. Oh, uh, this is slicing it. So this is where we turn it from a model into something that the where the um, where the printer will know exactly where to lay out materials. Okay, so that is the model that we used um, and it was saved onto an SD card. And then here's an example of the first attempt to print that Eiffel Tower. And you can see that it's still moving, but nothing, uh, nothing was happening. So what happened was that the filament jammed uh, somewhere, um, somewhere higher up in the mechanism. And uh, so the, the print head kept going, but nothing was coming out. Um, and this is another example of the Eiffel Tower. Now you can see that there was a piece that was laid down that actually lifted up and moved. Uh, and so uh, the, the baseline of the adhesion of the filament sticking to the printing plate uh, wasn't, it didn't stick well enough. And so part of the print lifted up and then it was building the print onto the wrong foundation. Um, so we had to go again and Here we have it.
So there we have our completed Eiffel Tower and a successful print. Um, so we, we used repositories such as Thingiverse, Tinkercad, Be Tactile, um, Smithsonian Digitization. Um, and so there was a lot to think about as we downloaded these files that we used from these repositories. Um, and sometimes we couldn't find exactly what we were looking for. Um, I really I really wanted to print out a good example of Clifford the Big Red Dog, for example, and Emily Elizabeth, and no one has created or had when I was looking for it, a digital file for a 3D Clifford the Big Red Dog. Although I did find some other dogs, um, but nothing, nothing that was exactly Clifford. Um, we definitely also found inconsistent quality. Some of the files were beautiful and printed amazing. Um, and then there were some that were mismatched in size or um, were misshapen a little bit. Um, and then scaling the objects again, sometimes distorted the objects so that details would be lost. And you really have to know exactly what you're doing when you're customizing um, a file that you found online for yourself. Um, and so looking at costs, the, the printers that we've been using were about $3,000. Filament is, is relatively cheap. Uh, it's about $30 a roll, but cost also comes in things like uh, comparing printing to um, finding commercially available products um, or models that are available through resource libraries, for example, and the, the cost of pa packaging and shipping those objects. Um, but also we have to think about the filament for the unsuccessful prints as well as the successful ones. So some of those um, Eiffel Towers that didn't work out out, for example. There were also uh, misprints. So when our first layer of filament didn't adhere properly to the print bed, things would lift up in the corners or warp a little bit. Um, and we also ran into some of the filament feeding issues where the filament would get stuck in the tubes and things like that and we'd have to start over. Um, and then we have to think about the time that it takes, first of all, to search for the appropriate object, to download it and prepare it, um, preparing the, the printers in order to print. So getting that adhesion um, ready, um, uh, calibrating the machine, and then uh, the time involved in babysitting the print. There are 3D printers that, um, uh, that have video monitoring and you can remotely stop the machine. Um, unfortunately, that's not, those aren't the printers that we were using. And as you can see here, we definitely had our share of, of misprints and difficulties. Yeah, so that was that was a day for the records. We had two uh, printers going, and um, the the same thing happened in both of them at the roughly the same time. And this was a matter of teamwork, where we were um, we were both looking at uh, babysitting the machine and taking turns and things like that. But in the in between stages, we missed uh, catching this right when it happened, and so um, with the hot print head, the electronics, and the plastic filament. This is what happened. We had a couple of slugs of filament and filament backing up into the print head. Fortunately, uh, Flo was able to work with our amazing technicians to get our printers back into working shape, so it worked out. Um, here are some examples of the miniatures that one of our teams built. Um, so their intention was to introduce some archi architecture to their students with visual impairments uh, and to compare the scale of different buildings and, and the shapes and things like that. Um, and another team printed these um, deafblind communicators pretty successfully and, and their students were really successful in using them. 
And there was another team that worked together with peers. So they had a drafting class who um, who created these 3D um, printing models in order to, to support their classmates who had visual impairments. Uh, so there was a student who created braille stickers uh, to put on a keyboard um, and some puzzles and things like that. So that was a really exciting opportunity for collaboration. Um, and then another student built a 3D model of the school so that they could have a, um, a tactile map. And then one of the teams, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, they wanted to look at braille signage. So there was a, a family that had three students um, who started going to a Chilliwack High School and there was not braille on any of the um, door labels. And so the students themselves uh, were going to have planned to start uh, printing 3D signs uh, so that they could put braille on all of the doors. Um, and so um, they advocated for themselves. So these students wrote a letter to, uh, to the principal for Sardis Secondary um, asking if they could do this and that uh, they could put the signs up. I think maybe we have a question. There we go. Um, and so the, they were they were told that yes, they could. But one of the barriers to the students doing um, doing this three uh, D printing themselves is that in the Tinkering Suite software where we hello. print or oh hello hello how are you sorry hi good I was glad I didn't miss the phone. Welcome. Um, so the, there were no keyboard shortcuts for using the software. Um, and so yeah, Flow so Together was a student. Oh, sorry? Hi, I'm going to mute people. So oh, just okay. People Thanks, that got Kathy. muted somehow. Yeah. No worries. Um, yeah, so Flow Together with the students emailed um, the, the software creators at Tinkering Suite and asked about um, uh, shortcuts and so they they did develop some updated shortcuts for the software so that the students would be able to um, independently work on uh, 3d printing their signs so here you can see they're measuring the pre-existing signage at the schools and um, this is an example of the coding that the students would have to do so they would have to go in and change the the braille on uh, in in the code, and uh, so Flo um, spent some time talking to the students about three D printing and how it works. And so this is uh, Dijon learning about three D printing. So Flo used it's a three D Scrabble game um, where you can stack the tiles one on top of another. And so in this example, um, Flo is the code. So she's telling Jorn, who is, uh, for all intents and purposes, the 3D printer, um, she's telling him what to do and he's creating something. Uh, so it's really neat to see Dijon make those connections um, in how the how the code works 
to tell the computer or to tell the 3D printer what to do. Um, we also learned uh, that when we print Braille, we need to print it vertically. Um, you can see the picture on the left there has um, horizontally printed Braille and it ends up being very sharp. Um, so we showed a few people who are Braille readers the difference between the horizontally printed bra uh, Braille and the vertically printed Braille and it's it's way softer and smoother if you print it vertically. It's very sharp and could maybe cut fingers open a little bit if, uh, if we print it horizontally. So that, that was a big learning piece for us. Um, and now I'll show you some of the students' stories. So this is uh, from a team who was looking at the three bears, or Goldilocks and the three bears, rather, and I think the three little pigs as well. So they were specifically thinking about scale and, and um, big, media, big, medium, and small, for example, of the mama bear, the, the papa bear, the mama bear, and the baby bear. And so this is a student who was learning about the, the story of the three bears. And so he, we have a video of him. Oh, and we can't play this video. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, we've got some technology issues going on. I, I apologize. But um, as they read the story of the three bears, he, uh, Mary, who is his a teacher of students with visual impairments, would hand him uh, the corresponding piece in the story so that he could explore that piece and see how it was the same and different um, from the other pieces in the story. Um, this is Penelope. She is another student who was exploring the 3D printed objects with, along with a story. Uh, they were working on reading the Gruffalo, and so Linda had printed out the characters from the Gruffalo for her. And it was really fascinating to see the discussion that the Gruffalo sparked for Penelope, um, particularly thinking about um, about uh, the animal's legs. Oh, and let's see if this will print for us. Um, I'm, I'm going to just see if I can turn that volume up as high as possible. Sorry. Um, but you can see that her question, her question that in that first video was, can a snake walk? Because she was, they were talking about how the snake didn't have feet. Uh, I'm, I apologize that the sound is so low on this one. I'll see. I, I have everything turned up as loud as I can, so maybe I'll skip that last one. Um, but the the third video, they're also they're looking at um, at a three D print of a mouse and talking about a mouse and and whether a mouse can walk. So it was really interesting for Penelope to hold these objects and feel them and under, and understand uh, the connection between having legs and walking and wriggling. There we go. Uh, so I did a lot of research into what had already been created in terms of 3D printing and literacy. Um, so I found that somebody had created 3D models um, of the book Harold and the Purple Crayon, which led to a lot of discussions about what would be valuable in being 3D printed. Um, so one of the difficulties with this one was that 
all of the files were of different sizes. So in order to make the, the image, the 3D printed image, relatively the same size, I had to blow some of them up by 300%, in which case they, they ended up being quite thick. So there was a lot of inconsistency there. Um, and as well, we talked about how useful it would be to have some of these images. Um, it might be useful in terms of talking about art um, and talking about uh, exploring um, what drawing is like and how people can be creative. But the 3D printed files didn't give a lot of information about um, what things actually looked like. Um, and so, for example, in this image, um, Harold ended up kind of just being a blob of plastic. So that wasn't really helpful for students to use. And so because of the way the print was, where it was a lot of simple lines, the, the prints ended up curling up um, because of the um, of the way the heat worked. And so we decided to go again, to, to not go with Harold in the purple crayon. Um, you can see one of the examples here, but uh, not everything was created in the 3D file either. So whoever had built these, these um, digital files had chosen to leave certain parts of some of the images out. So that was also really interesting to see. Um, I also found that somebody had created digital files for Goodnight Moon. In this case, the files for all of the pages existed. Um, and so we wanted to look at um, how useful it would be to have a 3D printed version of a book. Um, and so we we decided to create three different versions of the book. Um, so I 3D printed the book. That's the one that you'll see, the image that you see in the center there. Um, I made a, a tactile book as well, and then a book bag. And we introduced the three different versions of the story to a couple of students. Uh, so here, this is um, this is items from the book bag. Now you can see the chair and the clock were among some of the items that I actually couldn't find something that was the right size or the right um, that had the right tactile information. Um, so I ended up 3D printing some of the objects. I printed the clock this the chair a little house and i think there was there was one other that's just not in the in the picture um and this is kelsey exploring the book bag so she's checking out all the different um story parts um and here we have the tactile book this one had no 3d printing involved um but it, uh it included a cat made out of fur with some with some really thin plastic whisper whiskers etc and this is kelsey exploring that tactile book So she's just reading the story and checking out the graphics. Um, and so then after Kelsey read all of the books, she spoke with her TSVI about which one she liked better and why. Oh. Debbie, it's still really hard to hear the sound. I'm wondering if you could maybe narrate over top and turn the sound. Sure, around. sure, no problem. So her teacher is describing the books that she looked at um, and asking her which one she liked to read better. And and Kelsey is saying that she liked the she liked the books where the the graphics were really close to the text. She didn't like the um, the book bag as much because the the parts were all separate. Um, 
she also said that she liked the, um, the 3D printed book the best because um, on the first page of that book, um, here, here the book is from the end. Um, on the first page for the book that you see there, that top um, 3D printed image gives the perspective of the whole room that the that the book is that the book takes place in. So Kelsey is adventitiously blind. Um, she lost her sight uh, when she was about three years old, and in this video, she's seven. Um, and her favorite was this one because it gave her the context of where the story was taking place. And she didn't know just from reading the book that it was a bunny that was narrating the story. But from this um, this 3D printed image, she could tell that there was there was somebody in that bed, and she learned that it was a, the bunny who was narrating the story. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a closer image of that first, uh, that first tactile graphic. Um, and then this is Caden, who also looked at all three books. Um, and this is just Caden talking about which one he liked best. Um, and Caden liked the book bag best. He, he preferred all the different separate objects because he could explore them more thoroughly. Uh, and it was interesting that Caden is, uh, is congenitally blind. And so um, we're, uh, it was interesting to see that there might be differences based on their the student's visual history as to which graphics um, give them more information. Um, and this one we ran out of, uh, we didn't actually have an image for, but uh, at the very end of our exploration, we started to um, explore articulated prints. Um, so um, we printed a 3D elephant and you just print the whole thing and then once you pull it off of the print bed, you can actually, its, it's legs actually bend and its head moves a little bit. Um, and so that was really exciting to see that um, you can build these, these 3D printed um, uh, models that that you don't have to put together anything, you can print it and it um, articulates. So that was an exciting um, part of our learning that we did. So other learning that, that we um, sort of gathered was that um, when you're trying to calibrate the 3D printer before you start to print, thermoform paper can work as a gauge to, to um, figure out how close the print head should be to the print bed. We learned a lot about the differences between printers, for example, Having a heated build plate means that there's a lot less warping. Um, so instead of the the filament cooling and bending, um, it would it would lay flat for longer. But those ones also took quite a lot longer to print. Um, our teams learned that the temperature in the room needs to be consistent. So they some of our teams really found that cold wet cold weather impacted their print progress. Um, again, we, we learned that we needed to print Braille vertically. Um, and when we printed the Braille plate vertically, we learned that we needed to have a brim around the object so that it would hold that plate up um, because otherwise it would just get knocked over by the print head. Um, and so it needed to have a skirt, so a, um, a layer of, plas of filament that was surrounded the print to, to keep it up. Um, and we learned a lot about that first layer adhesion. So um, some teams found that uh, blue painter's tape worked really, really well. Um, we found hairspray was a good, um, was a good adhesive. Um, and then glue stick was, was pretty good, but uh, was kind of messy because it was a, a lot thicker. Um, the prints end up being fragile and quite brittle. So that again plays into what you're going to be printing and what you might want to print it for. Um, and they also tend to sometimes have sharp corners. So it's important to be aware of, of who is going to be using that object and what they'll use it for. 
Um, so we want to in the future, so that we did this project last year and we have had some, some of our team members are, have chosen to carry on with the project this year. Um, and so we'll do a little bit, we're going to be doing some more, uh, more, some more research with the project this year. Um, but it definitely brought to mind the questions about who's the best person to take ownership of the process. It was a very time consuming um, and intensive learning that we needed to do in order to, in order to have successful prints. And so um, this is something that we're still, um, we haven't come to any solid conclusions about, but um, for a TSBI to spend that much time sitting next to a 3D printer um, might not make the most sense in a school environment. Uh, so there might be other people who would be better suited to actually creating the 3D prints. Um, so we're going to continue with the, the core group. Um, uh, and we were we plan to invite others who were interested. We didn't have any takers this year, um, but that also pulls into question. Um, so how how do these teams acquire a printer, get the training, and get the filament that they need to create these objects? Um, and so those are some things that are, will continue to be explored. Um, so. If you follow this link, learningnetwork.setbc.org slash 3D printing, this is where Flo and I blogged about our experiences with the 3D printing last year. Um, and so you'll see a lot of what uh, the projects that I, that I was talking about today and some of our learning experiences, um, as well as links to the, the other team's blogs. Um, so you can find that at, in our aftershare. Does anyone have questions? Are any of your 3D printed color? Yes, so our 3D printer, the, the, the machines that we were using can only print in one color. And so, like one color at a time rather. Uh, and so whatever we printed was uh, just one color. So for example, um, the team who did the three little bears, their prints were in black, red, and blue. Um, the the prints that I did for the um, for the Good Night Moon book, a lot of them were in that sort of honey color um, and clear, and then some of them were in gray because we had to use a different three D printer for it because those that was another example of inconsistent files. Um, if I printed all of the, the Good Night Moon um, files in the size that they were uploaded onto the internet, um, I would have had all kinds of different sized plates. And so um, some of them I had to print on a computer, on, our, on a printer that had a heated bed in order for, for the print to actually be successful. But yeah, um, we did print in a variety of colors. Do you do work for um, Edmonton Public Schools or Edmonton Catholic Schools with these? We, um, we, we are a BC Ministry of Education program, and so all of our work is with, um, within BC. We are happy to share our learning and share our files and things like that. Um, we, don't, we haven't built a repository of items or anything like that at this point. Uh, we are good friends with the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired here in BC. And so we've talked a little bit about um, 3D printing things for them to have uh, as part of, in part of their resource catalog. Um, but at this point, uh, we, we don't have any things that are available for people to, um, to borrow. So is there a website for their resource catalog? For um, the, the library of books? Here, CBI? Yes, um, yeah, so, so they, do have, they do have a website. Um, the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired have a website that has their resource catalog. But um, unfortunately, that is only for, um, for British Columbia. Um, if you're interested in, in using any of the files that you saw 
um, today in the presentation or that you'd see on our blog or something like that, feel free to email me. I'm happy to share um, any of those resources that, that we used. Hi, it's Kathy. I'm just going to Hi, chat Kathy. in here. And um, my grandson has woken up, so he's joined us here. Um, I wonder if you have explored any other options for 3D printing. I know what we've done here in Edmonton is to use the uh, Edmonton Public Library before they closed mm -hmm. down for renovations. Mm -hmm. And I know, that, again, my experience is I've used the University of Alberta um, for the, and they, I mean, if, I think you, what you guys have done is amazing and really interesting, but it's also an onerous and complicated task. So Absolutely. have you tried to outsource it before you did this? Um, so this was an exploration about how useful 3D printed um, items would be in terms of literacy. And so uh, that that is part of the conversation that is starting to happen now is like who who should be responsible for doing this and how useful is it um, in, in BC? Uh, I see somebody asked, um, is there a goal for people who are continuing with the project focused on a certain curriculum? Um, so um, the team that was uh, that, that had the students creating the signs themselves, they, um, they are continuing to 3D print those signs um, because they didn't uh, get it all the way through their project. So I know for them, continuing with the signage is what they're working on. Um, and then the other teams, I think there are, I think there are two other teams that we're continuing to think about literacy at this point. Um, somebody suggested that you can change the filament color in the middle of a print and you would just get a bicolor object though. Um, because it would change in the middle. Uh, I know that for the printers that we used, this wouldn't entirely be possible because once you change the filament, um, it would change, it would uh, overheat the spot where the printer paused. Um, and so we were we weren't able to change it, but I know that some uh, some printers you have that ability to do so. Debbie. Yeah. My name is Janice. I'm in Hi, Canada. Janice. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if the filaments can come in different types of plastic. Are there different yes. feels to plastic? Yes, there are. Okay. Um, so when, when Flo and I were in Edmonton in May for the Canadian Vision Teachers Conference, we, we chatted with some people and they actually gave us some uh, filament that was a lot softer than what we've got. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work in the 3D printers that we had based, because of the temperature that was required um, to, to use that filament, but we, we were hoping to be able to print, uh, to print some braille with that to see if that would be um, a better tactile feel than, than some of the harder plastic that we were using. But yeah, absolutely, um, the I different spoke, filaments. Yeah, I spoke to them as well. Um, mm -hmm. We have had um, some of the Project Core tactile symbols made and they're a really nasty. The, the, oh that was used in Calgary, it was a really nasty touch. And oh. I was happy to hear you say about the vertical versus horizontal for the Braille, mm. because the horizontal was not good at all. Um, yeah. So I am not, um, we're still playing around with some of those pro project core symbols because mm -hmm. they all feel pretty much the same for so some of the lower functioning kiddos. And we've had some yeah. SLPs that have done some modifications. So. It's a process. <laughs> but Absolutely. Can I, can I chime in there just a little yeah. bit? But I've also been talking with um, Gretchen Hanser, who was involved in the original Deaf Blind project out of um, the University of Chapel Hill, and that's where the, the Project Core stuff came from. And mm -hmm. um, Gretchen's going to be doing a couple of webinars for us. And one of the things I wanted her to talk about is, is her worry that in doing it with the 3D printers that perhaps lost a little bit too much information because the original yeah. the original symbols had lots more um uh tactual information than just with plastic so to be continued and uh, mm -hmm. debbie i would love you to join our webinars because i oh. think you have some wonderful insights and questions that sounds great. Well. so yeah, yeah. 
Well, and that's also a really important caveat to make is that as you're introducing any of these 3D printed objects, regardless of what it's for to students with visual impairments, we have to keep in mind that these things all feel kind of like plastic, like rough or smooth plastic. And to be um, really cognitive of, uh, of, of talking about how um, in reality, sort of the, the mouse that was printed for that one student, a mouse doesn't feel like like smooth plastic, right? All right, are there any other questions? This has been really an interesting um, session for me to watch. I really am rather happy that I got to pop in. Um, and great. good for you guys for tackling, you know, taking on um, something and exploring. And then are you gonna write a final report? Will that be shared? Do you, do you know? Um, so I, I actually, because I'm in um, the program at UBC, I did write a paper on it. Um, and I actually, I did post that on the blog. So um, anybody is welcome to check, check out our 3D printing blog. Um, and that's where all of our conclusions and our thoughts and, and our process are, it's all, that's where it all is. So you're welcome to head over there and, and check it out. Where is that located? Uh, learningnetwork.setbc.org slash 3D printing. Right, thank you. No worries. Any other thoughts or questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Counting to 10, which is my usual way of doing it. Mm hmm all right, well, seeing none, and Debbie, you, you did share your email as well at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So yep. if people do think of something that they want to ask you afterwards, I'm sure they'll be able to do that as well. Absolutely, so, and you can find both Flo and I on the SETBC website um, in the contact page. So feel free to find us there, and our email uh, information is there. Great, good. So thank you for um, we, thank you so much for the great presentation and sharing with us and I couldn't agree more. It was really fun and um, nice. having always outsourced any 3D printing, it was interesting to see the trials and tribulations. <laughs> so, <laughs> but mm -hmm. lots of good learning, lots of good learning. So yeah. um, again, I, I, I will say on behalf of um, all of the TVIs and I'm gonna also share this with some other folks that are working on uh, textual symbols mm -hmm. um, because I think that uh, uh, as we share, as you walk through the trials and tribulations, we can learn and perhaps not don't have to do them. Mm -hmm. And good insights mm -hmm. about the fact that the cost effectiveness that goes down substantially mm -hmm. when you're thinking about mm -hmm. having TVI. So yeah, excellent. Thank all you. Right. Thank, Thank you all you. for participating. And um, yeah, we will. I, don't, I probably won't see you next time, but I will see you around. And Debbie, it was nice meeting you. Okay. Nice to meet you all. Bye.